Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV and a new week and a selection of kind of random shows this week. But today, right now, we're returning to the Anzio Beach Head with Eddie and Richard of the fantastic Irish Brigade website. Link and description in, uh, below. And uh, they also run, or Eddie runs, this week in the Italian campaign. Again, the link is in the description below. It's a great YouTube channel. Go out, sign up, make sure you start watching. And we're going to talk about the London Irish Rifles and the Irish Guards on the Beach Head. So I bring the guys in. Good evening, folks. How are you today? Very good. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. So um, before we get into the presentation, um, Eddie, talk about your Anzio conference and what you're trying to do. We, we you know we've talked about it a little bit before in the past about these various um, gatherings you're organizing. So so plug what you're doing and how people can get involved. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, what's happening? We're working with the Italian partner uh, in Anzio uh, on the liberation of uh, Rome conference. And this is going to cover all the events up to the liberation of Rome on the 4th, 4th of June, 1944. So it's the 80th anniversary this year, and we're holding the event in Anzio on the 31st of May to the 1st of June. We've got the support, as I said, of the Italian local and national government. We've got eight governments uh, across who are the, from the nations involved in this. So not only the British, Americans, the Canadians, New Zealanders, the French, uh, and the Italians, but also the German government supporting the event. And we have about 20 expert speakers. It's going to be a great event. And uh, I've posted a link in the to the conference agenda. And there's a way of booking a place. I did. Uh, we, we keep in the cost down for a mission as little as possible. So it's, uh, it's going to be a great occasion, a very important launch of the Freedom for Italy network. This is a new organization which is going to create network across Italy uh, that is going to engage with memorializing the Second World War in Italy. Uh, right across the country so it's a, a, this is an initiative which is about italy by italy for italy but looking out to international partners so uh, we're very excited that we can a very good response in italy this is most important to us where our father was in from mm. 1943 when he landed in sicily until eventually he crossed the border into the third reich uh, the day after the end of the war in europe well this is what we love about this modern era of com people coming together from different countries look at history because we've talked about it so often this channel americans write the history for an american audience british write it for a british audience etc etc now thanks to almost coming out of the covid era still we're much more collaborative now we we tend to try and get involved with other people and listen to the italian point of view and the sicilian point of view and the tunisian point of view and people like yourselves and trevor she and what he's doing over in tunisia it's a it's a brave new world i think i'm looking forward to the what's happening next but anyway folks we're going to talk about the italian campaign so it's a it's a mixture of richard and eddie doing this uh fire away with questions as we go along but we're going to learn about these two units that don't have a direct connection, but do have a, 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 a several threads that tie them together, not least of which the Irishness. But we'll hand over to Richard and Eddie to take us through this. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, as all your viewers would expect, um, we won't go into full depth of the rehearsed, the whole Battle of Anzio, of course, but we just observe the connections and, and the the way that the Irish Guards and the London Irish Rifles, the 1st Battalion London Irish Rifles, fought to Anzio in January, February and March of 1944. Um, at this stage, just to clarify and update for those who don't know, the Irish Guards, as you know, was formed in 1900, 1st of April, as a consequence of the good fighting spirit of Irish men in, uh, in the first part of the Irish, sorry, the Boer War, Queen Victoria. Um, passed a directive that the Irish Guards were formed in 1900. The London Irish Rifles, on the other hand, was formed in 1859 as part of the volunteer movement, which was a, a big event in the mid-19th century. One of its first members was actually Lord Palmerston. And in both cases, the London Irish Rifles particularly uh, was, a was a London based regiment and attracted Irish men and women born in Ireland, those of Irish descent, uh, and those who had interest in the Irishness, Irish men and women in London. The Irish Guards, of course, the recruitment of the Irish Guards historically was very heavily from Ireland, the island mm. of Ireland, and 1900 the first. So the Irish Guards came into being, and both regiments served, or battalions of both regiments served in the First World War, obviously. And the first time they sort of came together in battlefield, duties was at the Battle of Luz in September 1915, you know, the famous 
footballers the blues for the london irish kicking the ball over on the 25th of september cliche or not it did happen um we have the football in the museum uh the irish guards and the guards brigade came the guards division actually two battalions of irish guards came to the battlefield just a few days later to actually take over the southern area the front and and, and so they actually is apophical or maybe true tales of the irish guards coming into the line bumping into Irish, London Irishmen who were coming back with a whole case of tea. Uh, there's one uh, account which was quite amusing, I've read several times. You know, the guards coming in the pucker way into the battlefield with the London Irish were sort of hobbling around with this uh, massive amount of tea. But of course, for both regiments, their time at the, in the First World War was um, very evocative and uh, memorable and, and very difficult, obviously, for, for both battalions. So their connection in that respect uh, goes back historically for various connections there. And in actual fact, up, uh, in 1937, up to the time of 1937, the, the regimental sergeant major of the London Irish Rifles was, was always an Irish guardsman. So even though the London Irish Rifles were part of the core of the Royal Ulster Rifles from 19... 25 29 onwards the the rsm up to 1937 was always an irish guardsman and later on of course the role last rifles connection became much stronger um just, put, just go on to the first slide paul um as i say i'm not going to rehearse the whole battle period at Luz. Uh, sorry <laughs> at uh, anzio uh but just to just the summarization of the the situation in mid-january 44 as, you, as you've had probably on other shows, uh, the, the attempt to break the Gustav line, to break out through the Leary Valley, all those red marks of in the middle on the on the black line of the Gustav line, these have taken part in the middle of January, 17th, the crossing of Cogliano River on the left-hand side, uh, and the 1st Battalion under Irish Rifles were involved in that. Uh, nearer to Casino, the Americans crossing the Gari, also known as the Rapido, and in the mountains to the north of Casino, uh, the French Expeditionary Force and the US forces trying to break through the Gustav line. So the attempt to land at Anzio was clearly a, a way of try to outflank, if that's the expression, uh, the, the Gustav line. The, the hope was then there would be a withdrawal of German forces from the Gustav line. The, 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 the wildcat, as described by Churchill, which um, was later described as something else, uh, landed on the 22nd of January. So that explosive point where the, 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 the troops arrived in Anzio. Let's move on to a little bit more detail about that first day or first few days um the new slide paul yep i'm sorry <laughs> i was looking at my own screen sorry yes you had it up um just to just to reiterate the first landing on the 22nd of january so in the in the natuno area south of anzio was the us third division the Ranger Force came into the middle. The area that we'll be speaking about more about tonight is the 1st Infantry Division landed north of uh, Anzi on the 22nd and moved inland. That red line, straight line, is via, via Anziate, which is the main road from Anzio port to, to northwards. And that was the real um, focal point of a lot of the battles for the 1st Infantry Division at the end of January into February. Uh, one of the circles, the highest circle, is ca um, Campiglione, Campiglione, which was mm. on Route 7, which is really the target of, of the, the initial breakout when they did actually do so. And the, 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 the darker blue circle is, is what we speak about in some detail here, Aprilia, the area near Aprilia, the factory. So it was, it was a, as we have heard probably from other correspondence on this channel the the the, the invasion or the uh, landings at anzo were, were were probably not sufficiently uh, resourced to to make the big difference but uh, the first infantry division which was british led and british forces landed north of anzio just move on to next one paul yep just in detail, there were three brigades in the 1st Infantry Division, as you probably know. Um, I'll just concentrate really on the 24th um, Guards Brigade. The 1st Infantry Division had arrived in the Tunisian theatre in March of 43. 
the, the, the 24th Guards had joined with the 1st Infantry not, not long before that. Uh, but the two brigades, three brigades of infantry, the 1st Infantry Division under Major General Penny, so they landed on the 27th north of uh, the Anzio port. The 24th Guards Brigade, represented by two, three battalions of guards, 5th Battalion Grenadier Guards, 1st Battalion Scots, and the 1st Battalion Irish Guards, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Montague Scott. There were actually nine battalions of guards at the end of 1943 into 44, nine specific uh, battalions of guards in the Italian theatre. So there were actually three brigades uh, as a consequence of Anzio and other fighting periods in this early 44. It, it reduced markedly over the succeeding six months. So we, the, the first Irish guards were part of the first wave of land in the 1st Battalion. Uh, in Tunisia, they had actually, uh, one of their men had been awarded a Victoria Cross at the end of the Tunisian campaign, a gentleman called Guardsman Keneally. Who actually his name was really Leslie Jackson if you read the the history of him he had uh, he had deserted at some point uh, the mm. honorary artillery company uh, and then re-enlisted with the Irish Guards uh, but showed great valour at the end of uh, April 1943 to be awarded the Irish Guards their, their first Victoria Cross of the Second World War uh, and um, they actually there was a second. Victoria Cross awarded to the battalion later on in um, in 1945. So to so just move on slightly now. Initially, as as you know well, um, General Lucas, who was the, the Sixth Corps commanding um, general, um, had not moved forward to break out. There was a lot of ambiguity in what the what the um, the actual ultimate objectives were i mean overall was to try to outflank german forces at the gustav line um there's obviously a lot of uh, narratives that say well we should have gone on rome yeah. the green flash on the right hand side where was the the american forces were actually um, encountered great difficulty moving forward to sistona and and the rangers lost i think they had 99 percent casualty on one particular occasion um uh, I won't talk about that in detail, but the 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 blue flash on the left is where the, this salient was emerging. So up the Strait Via Anziate towards Campiglione, the objective to reach uh, Route Seven, uh, which is not really the best use the road into Rome, but it was an objective and the railway in that area. Uh, so the Irish Guards and the Guards Brigade and the other two brigades of uh, First Infantry Division over the period from the 29th onwards, 29th of January. So they took seven days to move forward into to an advancing, real massive advancing position. And they they had vicious fighting in the north or near Campiglione. And this is where the Irish, Irish guards were uh, significantly tested mm. as the other, other battalions were. Uh, the fun as it emerged, just a, a salient so by the start of february the germans started to attack well, it had resisted that advance up the road um and the first advance of the first infantry division was thwarted german forces then started to eat away at the shoulder of the salient so over the succeeding few days um, the, 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 there was huge counter-attack by german forces but not the major destroy the bridgehead type of attack but they were undermining the first infantry division and it was that in the start of february um I, I skated over really what the brigade of guards faced and i mean ultimately the 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 irish guards suffered about 80 percent casualties during this period as all the battalions did in the in this campaign so it was dreadfully difficult for them all um by by the start of february the the word they needed reinforcements so the word went out maybe move on to the next one and just a quick question for you richard um yeah we talked on this channel about anzio about mark clark and roman objectives and beachhead in the in your study of the guards to what kind of level in the guards have they any awareness of the big strategic picture? Or are they just being told it in matter of that town, that ridge, that that you know that hill? 
I think at that, at that level, battalion and brigade level, it was real tactical level. That the Route Seven, which is uh, there's the railway you can see coming up yeah. from the, the southeast, which went through Camp Leone. So Camp Leone Station was one of the major objectives, and Route Seven. Um, overall, the objective ultimately would have been to break across past you know through the Auburn Hills and cut Route Six, which was the main road, the Via Casalina from from Casina. Uh, as far as I know, and I'm pretty uh, you know I would be you know if someone has any other information. It was very much a tactical exercise to break this German line to gain the 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 routes north west into the Rome area. Um, the the command from Alexander, I mean, you know, we we hear the many stories that they wasn't. It was slightly ambiguous. Clark took it one way, told Lucas, "Don't stick your head out." He yeah. was the call commander. So I don't know more okay. than that, really. That's good, thanks. We'll move on to the 56th London Division. Just a little bit of detail. Uh, so early February, the message, so the London Irish and the rest of the 56th London Division were at the Grigliano River, so they crossed with the other uh, divisions, the 5th Infantry Division and the 46th, which was the difficult crossing of the Grigliano River on the 17th. Um, and the message came that they should send a brigade, the 168 Brigade, not the whole division. So they were asked to send uh, a brigade to support the bridgehead. So they, on the 2nd of February, the 168 Brigade uh, arrived in the Anzier bridgehead. So the divisional commander, Major General Templar, it was, he didn't move across. Uh, Penny was still the 1st Infantry Division commander. Templar actually took over in the middle of February as Penny was severely injured. So Templar actually at some point took 56th Division and the 1st Division later on in the, in the, um, in the bridgehead. The 168th Brigade was the 1st London Irish Rifles, the 1st Battalion London Scottish Regiment and the 10th Battalion Royal Berkshire Regiment. Who after the um, who after the uh, the Anzio fighting in March was actually disbanded and lost so many. Um, 167 Brigade didn't move across until the middle of um, February, 13th of uh, February, into the bridgehead. Two battalions of Royal Fusiliers and the Seventh Battalion Ox and Bucks Light Infantry, and 169 Brigade, who actually came to the bridgehead even later on the 8th, 17th of February, 18th of February. Those two three battalions of the Queen's Regiment. Um, 168 Brigade is, is one we'll just concentrate a little bit more on in this talk. So move on just to see. Yeah, so that's a, an evocative photograph actually in the Imperial War Museum, um, um, well, film, Army and Film and Photographic Unit, photograph stored by the Imperial War Museum, 168 Brigade moving in with the London Irish. I don't think they quite knew. I mean, the message that came to them at the Grigliano River was almost a, what a relief, we're leaving the Grigliano River. You're going to Anzio. It was almost, the regimental history was almost suggesting it was a relief to go to Anzio. Mm. Um, that may not be exactly accurate, but uh, yeah. they, they, they moved across. So that's them moving forward to the line. The, the actual men of the London Irish, if we see some of their names, on the next slide that's Ian Good, Rupert Good. he he was a, a, a actually a regular role of the rifles officer who who moved to become commander before the regiment moved went off to Iraq in August 1942 he took over on the left hand side of the photograph was the former commander Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jack McNamara with uh, General Montgomery at the time. They were, they were, that was in Kent in 1941. McNamara was interesting. He, he, he was an MP for Chelmsford um, and, and he was a friend of Churchill's, but he wasn't allowed to take the command of the 1st Battalion under Irish Rifles overseas for, I think, partially for security reasons if he was captured and any a number of things. He had been commanded since 1938. He was actually an instigator of the introduction of the Corps Bean, which is that Mm. shaped baggy hat that the men are wearing fortunately i'm not wearing it tonight paul you'll be pleased <laughs> you can tell well, i mean it don't yeah you just when you you come on and wear that you just out outdo me that's the only thing it's uh you know my, my hat is my hat but when you've got the core cool bean on you just you know you, yeah, you, you yeah, pass, yeah. It, it just it works what can i say 
Well, I'm not sure he did in that case, <laughs> but thank you for that. <laughs> um, I mean, a lot of the officers, so those names of officers in Italy in early 1944, so it was uh, the... The heir to the Viscountcy of Cordown, Earl of Cordown, was Monty Stockton, was second in command. Um, these men were largely men who, was, who were territorials pre-war. So if you look at the order, uh, the officer role in 1940, sorry, 1939, a lot of these men's names are familiar in that list in joining 1937-38. The London Irish were a West End-based outfit uh, in the Duke of York's, which is now fairly plush well it always has been as so a a plush area sloan square so monty stockford was the second command john canterbury the hero of the um uh the last battle on the on uk soil the battle of gravney marsh september 1940 where he uh, found a time bomb inside a junkers 88 which he took out and uh, exploded he got a george medal for that john canterbury had Harry Lofton, a brother of John Lofton, who was a commanding officer of my father's battalion, the 2nd Battalion. Um, Mick Cummins, and you, know, you can tell a few of the names are very Irish, even though they weren't necessarily born in Ireland. Bill Brooks, who was awarded a military cross at Anzio, as well as at Sicily, severely wounded here. And MacMahon Marne, who was, a, a, the, it was a OC. Though, so these men have very much come from London all through the campaign, even though Sicily... The, the, the blood in a fire in Sicily was difficult. They didn't lose that many officers, but they came into Italy um, with the same cadre of, of leaders. So they were quite well trained and, uh, you know, come through together. Grigliano started to cause problems. 250 casualties at the Grigliano alone in one week wow. out of a whole battalion of, well, at full strength for about 800. And the, uh, the rifle battalions are obviously 400. Um, in total, really, the A, B, C, D, or E, F, G, and H. We just got a so, quick question, Richard, um, which, uh, I mean, some people will, under, will know this already, but for those who are perhaps outside of the UK, Americans watching this, Jeff is asking, how do you distinguish which units are regular and which are territorial or volunteers? And I'll let you give your answer in a minute. But by 1944, there's really no difference. From from my point of view, you can maybe add something. In 1940, yes, in 1940, your first battalion is generally your kind of overseas battalion your, and your second is, not, is, that, is your home battalion. But would you agree that by 44, it, it's all just a mixture of conscripts and volunteers and, and wherever they can get people from? Um, not, not exactly, but the, you know, the concept, I mean, the London Irish actually is, is a terror, was a territorial regiment. So when the territorial army was formed in 1908, when the volunteer uniform, you know, the historic volunteer regiments were, were really ushered into the mainstream army or army reserve as we might call it today the london irish remained london irish rifles yeah. remained so it was all volunteers of course conscription came in 1916 in the first world war and the two battalions of london irish set going up to date in the second world war the first battalion Britorials, uh all volunteers uh, pre-war uh, and in 1939 a second battalion was formed my father was conscripted in 1939 so he wasn't regular he, he you know he was conscripted into a territorial regiment mm -hmm. um quite a few of the officers in this case rupert could was a regular officer and after the casualties of early 39 14 41 42 quite a lot of the officers of, of every regiment it was it, that's really comes into what you've just said a lot of the resourcing was from regular units as yeah. or else coming from wherever they could get people conscripted people the officers you know who's uh commissioned back you know for quite short notice coming in as commissioned into royal Arsenal rifles as regulars or commissioned into the territorial army so there's i didn't answer that very well but well, no you uh, did yeah. and, i mean it, uh, 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 eddie, they, eddie wants to help me as well yeah, the the I think in terms of the what you call the enlisted men, that's the uh, uh, the NCOs and the uh, the riflemen. Um, the conscripts became very significant right from the beginning. So it was a lot of conscri uh, conscripts. Where it uh, really applied or had a distinction is at the officer level, and right through the war, almost to the end, there were uh, there was a, dis a difference of opinion, higher command, about whether or not. It was good to promote uh, people who were not Sandhurst trained, who had been brought in as conscripts or volunteered and hadn't gone through the Sandhurst training. 
and that applied i know in the in the uh, irish brigade which the second battalion of the london irish was part of uh the commander of the irish brigade that up to the start of 1944 he basically didn't like having officers who weren't scientists he wanted he wanted them and he was very reluctant to promote up uh, to company commander and hire a company commander anybody who wasn't santos trained i think that attitude changed by necessity i mean it just had to didn't it i mean there was no way you could keep those rules i mean you, you, you know we look at the 14th army out in india and all those those kind of units you know they, there was no way they could hold on to those kind of rules it was just yeah it's it, we should do a show on that one day about how the british army faces um, the outbreak of war in 39 and 40 and what it becomes later on. We could get Robert Lyman on to talk about that because it was an e evolution in terms of of um, the organization of the British Army and its mindset. But that's another another rabbit hole for the day. But let's um let's move on, Richard, and, and take us into February and the fighting. Yes, as I said, that picture we previously saw was the one Irish coming into the line. They expected to be a res the 168 brigade were expected to be a reserve brigade for the first infantry division, but because of that on on the 7th the huge german attack down the main via as and Ziato. they'd cut the farm out so they were attacking the main area forces and near aprilia this area described uh, carasetto and aprilia and the area known as the factory so the london irish the Irish Guards have suffered greatly during the early part of the battle as they move forward. At this point, the the, the Grenadier Guards on the left-hand side, as you can see, you, know, you can't see it very clearly, but the, the main attack was down the road uh, towards Anzio Port. The London Irish Rifles met the brunt of it with, with the Guards Brigade and some elements of that. Uh, you know the good story of William Sidney was awarded the Victoria Cross with the 5th Battalion Grenadier Cards in this uh, in this attack or thwart, helping to thwart the attack. But in terms of the London Irish, the, the, the D Company, for example, which was uh, the front unit or, or front infantry, sorry, rifle company of the London Irish was met uh, met the full force on the overnight 7th into the 8th. One platoon disappeared um, and they weren't allowed. The message came back, you know, we, we're going to be cut off. And Ian Good had told them, no, no, you can't you can't uh, retreat. This has to be, even though the stop line, the real core stop line is further to the south, they, they, they remained in their post. And actually the whole company disappeared. All three platoons were captured over the course of the next day in, into the 8th of February. So uh, McMahon Mann, Major McMahon Mann, sorry, all name, um, he, he was severely wounded after being captured. And he, it was later, he said, you know, they, they, they uh, had just been surrounded and captured. You know, there have been friends of mine whose father, fathers have been captured. Um, they were stretcher bearers. So there was there's some conversation in some of the regimental history about there were occasions where there was felt that the Geneva Convention might have been breached, but uh, where, you know, the German forces had taken over a regimental aid post, um, not correctly. Uh, and, but the, 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 the part of the problem with researching some of the history of the London Irish Rifles, the, the war diaries for February 1944 are missing. So they're not available in the National Archives. So we've got a, a fairly good regimental history. I don't know where it's actually it was written in 1948. So uh, hopefully that that, that, that that represents some of the truth of the matter, given it was written so soon after the war. But some of the specific detail um, uh, isn't there. But the upshot of that period was uh, over the three days from the 7th, 8th and 9th, uh, the Grenadier Guards and part of the, the 1st Infantry Division, the Royal Bouchers in rough terms were disintegrated and, and later were disbanded. But the four battalions of or four companies of London Irish infantrymen, riflemen, uh, at the end of those three days ended up with a, with a, a strength of less than one company. So they lost 75% of their riflemen in, in three days. And that's not, um, that was not a, not a unique example of any of the battalions in the bridgehead during this period. So if you move on, I, I'm going to pick out. So just that so you mentioned the, the factory, it was on a slightly high point uh, to the southwest of, of the town of, of Caracetto. 
uh, Aprilia. It was a new town. It was built in the 1920s, 30s. The the um, the marshes were drained. We we know well about the Pontin marshes, but the areas around this, it was just like a modern town. So you, you see some of the buildings that, that, that in that. It was a sort of sort of quirky in our eyes to this day, yeah, modernized town. And it was called the factory. And this is where the fulcrum of some of the major fighting over that period was. Um, uh, the factory, just moving on. Just picking out uh, just a particular example of the story of of one of the men, Richard Haig, who I met about five or six years ago um, in his nursing home. And he showed me how to wear a coal beam properly, as you can tell. Um, but you can, if you read the story, he was, he, as he described it to me, he said he was relaxing somewhere in the reserve company, just, you know, that I'm sure wasn't true, but he, you know, in rough terms, he was relaxing. Got the call to be brought up to take over B Company and immediately had to get into almost a hand-to-hand -hand fight with Germans who were coming in. You can tell he was wounded. I mean, this is his citation for the military cross, so, you, you know, an element of, you know, it was obviously witnessed by a senior officer. I don't know if it was Hardy or someone else. Um, and then he got into a fight of throwing grenades as though they were going to make the difference. And of course, he got wounded and severely wounded, but he was able to come through. But it was like a visceral hand-to-hand -hand attack in, in the factory area. So that's an example of what they were facing in that period. And it's interesting, Richard, because, you know, we've, we've talked about the Rangers uh, in their involvement just down the road. Next week, John McManus is on talking about the 7th Infantry Regiment. Of it. It's one of those battles normally... From a Normandy point of view, the, the various nationalities are fighting in distinctly different areas, and the Americans over there, the Canadians. This part of the Anzio beachhead, it's you, the lines are very close. The, 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 the nations are fighting for the same pieces of turf, essentially, aren't they? Yeah, and I think perhaps I skated over a bit of it. That actually the 45th Infantry Division was brought up into the sector and underpinned when the London Irish left the line for a brief period on the 9th and 10th of February. The 45th the US 45th Infantry Division came in, and and the first Armoured Division there were there also Harmon's group, and um, so a lot of the the vicious fighting. I mean, is a bit, um, you know, calling it vicious is ridiculous, but, you know, some of the hand-to-hand the -hand fighting in the factory area was, as he, over the period, was into the middle of February, was American and British together, hand-to-hand. -hand. Mm, wow. Let's, Moving on. Yeah. So, from the 10th, the London Irish were brought out of the line. As I mentioned, the 167 Brigade were, were also brought across from Grigliano, uh, river that was the Ox 7th battalion ox and barks and the two battalions the royal fusiliers and now they were moved so that major big red line was um eddie might be able to uh to um pronounce it better f f f uh, fish lang was it operation fish lang fish fang fish fang fish which teeth. was the which was the f final which was felt to be the, uh, the 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 advance of German tanks and uh, armoured and infantry to break the bridgehead in half, to reach the beachhead, uh, advancing down the Via Anziata. And as I mentioned, the 55th, 45th Infantry Division, the US, faced the brunt of that. So when the London Irish were brought over to the left-hand side of that main road, they moved into an area described as the Wadis. It may sound a bit weird, another one of those legacy comments of the desert i suppose um the area near the factory is very flat and now it's obviously much more built up in those days very flat you could see the factory but on the left hand side there were some undulating areas and when there was heavy rain as a you know the former um um marshes but there was areas of very heavily undergrowth areas of heavy undergrowth and they described it as the wadis because there were deep sort of channels of flooding that uh, ripped into, you know, do you see it? Yeah, that's right. Um, and it was like, it was described almost like a jungle area. And and it sounds hard to believe. Um, I wasn't there, of course, but you go there, there are in undulating areas. You can stand in some of the, the high ground in in that area and, and get a sense of the, what might be there, but not quite to the extent of the of that, the waddies. Um, so the London Irish were sent 
again, they came to the line. They were down now. They had us had a reinforcements of about 150 came in when they were at rest for the five days. They were brought forward. When I say rest, they weren't very far from the front line. They were just a couple of miles down the road. But they came up the London Scottish, sorry, the, the Fusiliers and the Ox and Bucks had, had, had faced heavy punishment. And the London Irish and the 168 Brigade were brought back into the line on the left-hand side of the main road near the Moddies. And they were asked to, to be firefighters again, to try to rescue some parts of, of, of 167 Brigade. So, so again, an example of a story, if you move to the next one. You know, one of the gentlemen or one of the officers, John Strick, who, who was, was a, a platoon commander, he had been wounded at the Grigliano River. Uh, about three weeks before, came back during the period of arrest. He was brought back into the into the battalion strength, and he he was killed in in a a, a, a strike artillery strike that came into his position. Um, Major Bill Brooks, who would be awarded the military cross for his time early in the in this campaign, was severely wounded. The reason I picked him out is it's not a very good photograph, but that portrait of John Strick. He was a pre-war territorial um, and he was a poet. He wrote poetry. He was the editor of of what was the forerunner of the Emerald or the Corbin, the regimental magazine. He was only 24 or 25 when he was killed on the 18th of February. But that portrait, which was uh, was painted by Edward Halliday, is a very well-known portrait artist. Some of his are in the... Uh, National Portrait, Ga Portrait um, Gallery was donated by his family after the war, and it's in the mess of the London Irish Rifles, or today the Number no. Fifteen Loose Company Irish Guards in 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 Camberwell. So when we ever have a meeting, we we look up at John, mm. um, looking down on us, frozen as a twenty-five year old, same age as our father. You know, you know mm. I don't know. It's one of those. It was a really beautiful painting, I think. And it's and, interesting because I, I was saying before we went live, I was listening to James Nall's podcast with Jonathan Fennell uh, this morning when I was walking around Bayer. And Strick is going to be a major character in in James Holland's next Italy book because he wrote at length about how cold it was crossing the rivers and how he had problems with his diet and he was then getting jippy tummy and things like that. And and when James, and I think Ed, Eddie was involved in the, getting some information to James, James is going to be using his account. And he had this incredible relationship with his Batman as well. Uh, and, and they were very, very close. And um, uh, so, so folks, what, watch out for more about Strick when the next volume of James's Italian uh, series comes out, because uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find out a lot more. Indeed. Um, he's buried at Anzio um, Cemetery. And we visit regularly and pay our respects to John and, and the other gentleman buried there. We'll be there again in May to, to, to pipe for him. Super. So, Moving uh, on. Indeed. So the end of, this cuts to the start of March, but the end of February continued. There was infiltration all down uh, the German forces, even though the, the, the main road was the key uh, axis of attack over, over the period. Uh, German forces were trying to cut through the undergrowth and other. It was quite tricky, armoured country, armoured uh, tank country. But uh, it was it continued. This the main attacks had petered out. When he says petered out, you know the the main attack had stopped by the twentieth of February, really. But it continued to be a, a drip drip of fight in a battlefield. And then on the second, the London Irish were asked to go and try to rescue a. a, a the Royal Fusiliers had been cut off, 167 Brigade, one of those coloured notes, and they went forward. Their first attack on the 2nd of March was disastrous. A few officers were killed. They lost about 20 on the 2nd, and they attacked again, which ultimately was successful, um, and they released the Royal Fusiliers from their, from their from being cut off. But as you could tell, the casualties were quite extreme. And another gentleman I picked out, another officer, Captain Mervyn Bonham Carter, quite a familiar name, I suppose, to us today. And just going on to the next sheet, it describes a bit of of, of Mervyn's. Um, he wasn't awarded a, a, anything for, for, for that attack, but he was killed. Um, usual description of valor wounded got up i mean if you read that with a with a very high level 
citation for a medal, you would say, well, that, that deservedly so. So it's in the regimental history. I'm not entirely sure how they got this account from the battlefield. Uh, but anyway, um, Mervyn Bonham Carter, just referring to his surname, he's actually the second cousin of Helena, um, the actress. Uh, quite strangely, because of the his grandfather was 17 years older than Helena's grandfather, so they're on the same generational level, second battalion, uh, second cousins, directly. Um, Mervyn's brother Basil was killed later that year, so th there were two boys in the family. Both were killed in Italy. He was wounded at the Gothic line. He was uh, Basil Boncart was um, was with the sixth battalion. Black Watch in the 4th Infantry Division and I'm not certain he, he could well have been at Casino because the 6th Battalion the 4th Division were at Casino mm -hmm. as you know their father when I looked it up because uh, Basil Boncart went to King's School in Canterbury and they, it describes their father was in a prison of war camp at the time I haven't quite worked out so the two sons have been killed and uh, the father was in a prison of war camp and uh, so their father was obviously uh, in his mid 40s or older um it seems the story and when helena bonacarda she did a program about her family didn't she in the second world war she uh, she described the family memories but didn't didn't mention mervyn so it's an interesting omission whether she's aware of Mervyn's story i don't know but um, we are and again yeah we... i mean we could literally do a week of programming about the bottom carters in world war ii and world war one because as you said with the asquiths with the i mean yes we, um the the because they, they, there's a bonham carter house in the village i grew up in near colchester in essex and uh if i right. remember correctly the bonham carters that were there were on the list of people that the home you know the the british secret home guard lot andy chatterton wrote about we're gonna we're gonna take out because they were considered dangerous to the germans there's an extraordinary massive story of bonham carters in world war ii it really it, it, we could have we could do a whole week on it but um yeah but that's a, it's a rabbit hole we'll cover maybe in the future yes thank you no i, I just picked that specific one story of mm -hmm. a man out of officer again yeah. pre-war came through the three years of training went to iraq and then uh got through the Grigliano River, or was injured there, I believe, or wounded, came back in the in the middle period of this Anzio bridgehead and, and killed very close to the end of where the London Irish were, were oh. taken out, out of the bridgehead. It's not a unique story. So just to summarise this period for these two battalions, I, I it was very much a high uh, top-down view of both battalions' time in the, in the bridgehead. Uh, the London Irish 1st Battalion left the bridgehead on the 11th of March, uh, but they went to Egypt for rest and re um, reinforcement and came back to Italy. My father's memory was getting on the, the gang plank at, um, onto, the, onto the ship at Taranto in the middle of July 44. He was leaving Italy after Casino and Chasameno meeting the Pope, all these things. And he was going for rest, or the battalion was going to rest in Cairo, Alexandria. And off the same boat was the first battalion coming into back into Italy. And he and my father's story was, oh, the, the he overheard a naval officer say, oh, they're just, the army don't know what they're doing. Because, you know, Corbyn's going on, Corbyn's coming about out. And he said, you know, he just had to explain this, this regiment has two battalions and, you know, both the Second World War, 40 battle honours in total. And a lot of which was specific, you know, a lot of sometimes battle honours are given to, well, they are to divisions, not not for specific fighting. And, and it's, this is what they looked like in July 44, looking happy again. But they were just off to the Gustav line, sorry, the Gothic line near Rimini, fought the winter and then uh, eventually crossed over the River Po in April 45 and went to Trieste area for peacekeeping. Not mm -hmm. the same men really not the same battalion uh the 10th Royal Berkshires was disbanded as we mentioned they couldn't yeah. get any reinforcements and the 10th was clearly you know a territorial outfit and the 10th battalion the second battalion of London Irish were in casino and other places the first battalion was still the first battalion by this stage they were heavily heavily diluted by other men from different areas of the UK um the first battalion Irish Guards on the other hand not on the other hand, but partially on the other hand, they suffered 750 casualties in their 
six or seven weeks in the bridgehead mass you know again 800 so that's on the face of it almost 100 percent casualty level um that's killed wounded and captured mm. so they had significant amounts of people captured in both both battalions did they returned to the uk in april 44 because even though there were nine battalions of guards in italy at, at some point in early 44 there was only one battalion of irish guards there was one battalion of welsh guards but they were in another brigade in the six armored division there were three battalions of grenadiers two battalions of cold streams and two battalions of scots guards so they the the the, the the casualties of those bit other battalions they were able to um push two battalions together so ultimately there were five battalions of guards at the end of this period at the end of the war really um an irish guardsman would be trained in a slightly different manner to a london irish rifleman it's an understatement obviously and there's other reasons why the irish guards would be wanting only specific reinforcements coming into their to their regiment so they went ha home the second and third battalion irish guards as you know were in in normandy and, yeah. and uh, you know the famous uh, michael kane character arnhem being an irish yeah. guardsman but in armor one of the other the second battalion i think was uh, was infantry so there were two other battalions in in the western front sorry in in normandy and then into the advance of arnhem so I mean, that's just... Richard, with, with what you've been saying today with what Alex Kershaw said a couple of weeks ago and what John McManus will say next week and what we've had in these other shows, you can understand why at a high level there were questions about the morale of the British and American armies in, in this period of the fighting year. Italy was at sort of crisis point in terms of just morale, uh, losses, losses of platoon commanders, losses of men, as you say, battalions had to be broken up. I mean, it, it, it makes you realise why we don't, we, we should be talking more about this campaign. I mean, everyone's focus is always, you know, Normandy and um, and it's fantastic um, history coming out of Normandy. But this period in Italy is is grim. And as you said, there's no, it, it carries on. There's another year of this to go. I mean, we're not, we've got another year of fighting in Italy and then up into Austria. It's, it's in, it, an incredibly overlooked campaign, generally speaking, I think. It's fair to say. I think, Eddie, would you like to say something about that? Um, yeah, I think that's tr yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. Although we were raised in the story of the Italian campaign yeah. by our father, who spoke about it fully, and he understood it all. And I think that is true. But I think what comes through from that slide, this slide here, tells you that this, this is First World War casualty rates. Yeah, yeah. This is first Battle of the Somme, first day of the Somme casualty rates. This is carnage. And, and this fighting in Antio, they, there was very limited air cover, very limited air cover. So this was very much an infantry battle. It was men with rifles slugging out with their counterparts, often no more than five yards away from each other. Uh, and this is uh, a, a, an absolute, and the battlefield all around the, the front, there were hundreds and hundreds of unburied bodies for months. It was just like the First World War because the final breakout didn't tell it until the middle of May. Now, and that is amazing challenge for formations. Some of them who are like the London Irish Rifles are not regular formations. These are volunteers and they're, they're conscripts. And yet their performance in terms of look at the casualty rate and performance mm -hmm. is strictly comparable. Of course, the Irish Guards, the Guards formations, and it's something worth talking about as a household division and with the height restriction you had to be a minimum height to get the guards yeah yeah uh, and they they also were very particular about the the commanding officers the household division the guards didn't like operating with the formation with too many other non guards formations and i think they were uncomfortable about non guards commanding officers at the brigade level too so this complicated the replacements whereas the london irish rifles could vector people in from wherever uh, I think it was much harder for guards formations, and particularly for, uh, for one Irish guards, which is why after this, this carnage, look at that casualty rate, mm. they returned to the UK, and that's where it remained for the rest of the war. Wow. Okay, well, we'll move on and talk about Harold Alexander, and um, back to Richard. Yeah, just only really a connected story. of We mentioned uh, the Irish guards at Luce, and that's where Alex came and, and, and was, at the time, in the 2nd Battalion. He had been wounded in November of 40 sorry November 1914 but then 
he was born in uh, 1891, so he was 23 at the outbreak of the First World War, became commanding officer in the First World War at various times, and acting in the capacity of both the 1st and 2nd Battalion Irish Guards, quite remarkable. Uh, and then after the First World War, then took roles in Latvia in the, in the quite an interesting uh, period in 1919. And then he went in, in the 30s to the Northwest Frontier, and we know that he uh, he was one of the last men of the British forces out of the, Dunkirk. But the, the the reason I put him up, you know, he's a revered figure. Well, he was in our household anyway. My father knew him or didn't know him. <laughs> Met him on the in in uh, near Tunis. So they called him the boss. Uh, he later, after the war, the picture on the left was is a very uh, nice uh, photograph that was taken. And, and on the right, he's actually a London Irish. Piper, I think General Hardin's with him, and, and I don't remember who the other one is, um, in, in the Pula area, 1945, middle of Pula, Pula, in, uh, I think it might be Croatia now, but um, near Trieste, um, and the two Irish Pipers, John Franklin uh, was one of them there, and the picture below is a lovely um, portrait, which is looking at John Strick, actually, in the Office of Mess mm. at Camberwell, um, and um, Field Marshal Alexander became honorary colonel of the London Irish Rifles after the war, and then later president of the Regimental Association. So the the Irish Guards connection in through him is very strong historically. There was another honorary colonel of the London Irish Rifles in the mid fifties, Basil Basil Euster. So their portraits are all in the the um, the officers' mess, and then uh, I think the final couple coming up. Yes, the connection to the current day, you may be aware, in 2022, what was number number um, D Company London Irish Rifles transitioned to become number number 15 Loose Company Irish Guards. So those men parading in Campbell or the Army Reserve um, Battalion, sorry, Company of, of the Irish Guards. So they they have taken up their, their role within the Irish Guards in the same vein uh, the London Scottish have become part of the Scots Guards, mm. formerly the London Regiment, um, both, and now uh, London Irish. So uh, Jeremy Mooney was the last honorary colonel of the London Irish on the left, and Ollie Banbrook is now the OC of Number 15 Lou Company. So the connection continues to the current day, and uh, we we meet with them regularly. So that was a quick skate through some of the... Uh, high level views of what the irish guards and the london irish rifles got up to at Anzio. well um, thank you very much richard and i want to bring eddie in as well and the two of you because we had a question earlier from peter o'connell about um the beachhead and lucas and alexander and you now you, you've been putting together this you know italy kind of week by week series on youtube eddie and have you come to any conclusions about the the failings of Lucas, if that's not too strong a word, and whether he's um, he did have enough resources to push in land or not have enough resources, or was you know what what's your take on things? Yeah, setting aside the personalities, the Anzio campaign was put together in an incredibly short period of time. Yeah. I mean, it was it was less than a month. They went from I mean, it already been it was always part of the strategy strategy if you call it strategy, but of an amphibious landing, um, but it was only approved. I mean, it was on Christmas Eve that mm -hmm. he was finally approved due to the uh, well, due to the pressure of Churchill. He was in the Marrakesh. Very irritating to have the Minister of War and Prime Minister just down the road shouting. Mm. Um, so it was put together very short notice. They didn't have enough. La I mean, the landing craft, the transport was a huge problem. Yeah, it's all about shipping. All about shipping. Yeah. Two only two divisions were deployed were were provided, and in those circumstances. And they didn't. I mean, they and they didn't know what they were going to going to face. They really didn't know. And they, of course, they couldn't anticipate what the German response was going to be. So, if you put those things together with the time of the year, the weather, I mean, it rained a lot. There was massive amounts of trench foot. Yeah, uh, something like twenty percent of all the casualties in the infantry formations in Anzio were due to trench foot in that First World War, because the riflemen and the infantrymen were standing in trenches up to the knees in water for four days. There was the weather. The, the the weather influenced the ability to uh, for the air force to provide the kind of cover that they would get later. And of course, famously in Normandy, uh, mm -hmm. where the air cover is critical. Um, the 
what really I think redeems the the the, uh, the Anzio landings, the operation, far apart from the incredible resilience of the fighting man, incredible is the is the role of the um, of the navy. Yeah, uh, the navy was critical in, uh, in and the artillery, and you know we famously, of course, the British artillery was famous in the First World War and the Second World War for its very high levels of effectiveness, and I think with that that might have not had a problem. Now, after all that then you can get into the personalities and um the uh, clark's diaries which you can read i mean you can get you go online and read clark's diaries i mean he's rude about practically everybody yeah he, he's fairly, fairly um fairly he, he's yeah he's rude about he, everybody. he's not he's positive about, about anybody Churchill. really apart from himself a little bit he kind of likes he's himself well, he's, he's close pals but he's rude about church and he's ru very rude about alexander yeah. he calls him a peanut and a feather duster i don't know what that means He's really rude about Alexander. He's really rude about Alexander's relationship with Churchill and, and the fact that he said that he said Alexander was sucking up to Churchill. Mm -hmm. And his account in diary is that there, he he was very, he, uh, Clark's view was, and he was stating it was reported in his diary, he said Alexander was very disappointed not to get Jumbo uh, Smith's, you know, the uh, Mediterranean. Wilson. Wilson. Yeah. Wilson, mm -hmm. uh, which was basically, that was Eisenhower's job. Eisenhower was sent back to Europe. And Alexander wanted that job. He didn't get it. And he went to Jumbo Wilson, uh, in, who was then in, um, he was in Egypt. And uh, Clark's view was that Alexander was very upset about it. And he was trying to curry favour uh, and, and make himself more significant by just going over to Churchill and agree with him. So Churchill came up with his plan. And, the, and, and Alexander's grasp of the realities of what this involved. And as Clark kept on saying, it said he doesn't really understand the operational realities of that. So um, uh, uh, the um, Clark is also very rude about Freyberg, the New Zealand, uh, who, beca who becomes corps commander of the New Zealand Corps in early February, very rude about him. He's actually not rude about Lucas. And when he mm. writes about Lucas, because Lucas is relieved on the 22nd of February. And he says in his diary that Alexander is very critical of Lucas. Uh, we get pressure from the top that Lucas isn't up to the job. And in the end, he, he goes to Lucas, I mean, quite in a moment. And Lucas, in his own diaries, is saying, I'm going to get the, I'm going to get the chop for this one. You know, it's not working out. They're really fed up with me. And the, the disappointment is coming from Churchill. It's going to Alexander. And it's all coming down from the top. And so Lucas was the obvious scapegoat for it. But, but Clark was very kind to him. He said he relieved him, took him out of Anzio on the boat and made him deputy commander. Of fifth fifth army, I mean, obviously, yeah, yeah I mean, motive. he wasn't, you know, he didn't, yeah, he, he just got pushed somewhere else, isn't it? And, and I think in this conversation we had it with Alex Kershaw on the first show about the Anzio is that the German counterattacks. You said yourself, they're ready. We the Allies couldn't have predicted the kind of the venom and ferocity of those German counterattacks along that whole, you know, that whole defensive line there. They, you know, Hermann Göring division, etc., etc., etc. But the issue is that the Germans are are losing incredible numbers as well. I mean, we showed the losses of the London Irish and the, and, the, and the Irish Guards, but the Germans are are bashing against this artillery and the naval support that you've been talking about. So it, if we're looking at it from a solely allied point of view, this is a disastrous campaign in terms of losses. But if you look at it from a German point of view as well, they're losing incredible numbers that they can't replace. They're losing their Luftwaffe that they can't replace as well. And okay, they can then fall back to the next lines, and there's another year of fighting to go. But they they've lost units they can't replace. Um, so you know, there, there's more to the Anzio beachhead than just looking at it as as those three or four weeks around January, February. That it, it all connects beyond that as well. Of course, and the Anzio was intimately connected with the whole Fifth Army offensive. It was trying to, there was the Garigliano crossing yeah. in, in January. There was the disastrous 36th Division attempt to get across the Gario Rapido River, which yeah. was. And Clark was, was at fault for that. I think mean, there's no way of denying he didn't, you know. No, I, I quite agree. But the, the thing is that they, you, you, you're managing a formations of about 100,000 people. You've got, I mean, he's moving around from Caserta. He's going into the, the bridge and he's coming back. He's feeling ill. He's going back. And then he's getting constant visitors. Alexander's coming over. The, the ability to communicate. Of course, today we've got email and we've got phone, and phones at work. They would, a lot of it was they were operating on bad information. They didn't have good intelligence. They didn't have the kind of information. And Clark was, you know, he was under a lot of pressure. I mean, at this point, I mean, at this point of the war, Clark was not only the commander of the Fifth Army. He was the commander of the Seventh Army. Hmm. 
because Patton was, uh, who was commander of the Central, American Central Army in North Africa, Patton was being sent back to Europe for a, a nothing job. And, um, and and then suddenly Clark found himself commander of both the Seventh Army and the Fifth Army. So he was an administrative chief executive of two armies, one of them in North Africa, one fighting over a 30, 40, well, I mean, they were separated by more than 100 miles, some in Anzio, some on the Gustav line. And on top of that, he was fully expecting to be uh, uh, to be uh, responsible for the operation, uh, the, the landings in, in south of France. And he was, he was supposed to be planning for that at the same time. It's hardly surprising that someone with that kind of situation is going to make some really bad decisions. And there's no doubt at all that the whole ANSI operation uh, from beginning to end was a, it was a cock up. Well, I wouldn't well, go and I think, and I on that note, I think we'll leave it there. I mean, it, it is. There's a lot more to discuss about Anzio, and we're going to be just, I mean, John McManus. I can't wait to hear his views next week as well on this summit. But right now, we will leave it there. So, Eddie and Richard, thank you very much for a superb effort. Folks, you know what to do. Go and watch their YouTube series. Go and check out the Irish Brigade website. Support what these two guys are doing because they are doing absolutely sterling work to honour this campaign, Tunisia, Sicily, and they they deserve a lot of thanks and and. And yeah, and Eddie, you've got a fantastic speaking voice. You too, Richard. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, tomorrow's show has been postponed. Matthew Graham is busy with the US Army. He's got, I'm going to reschedule that next week. We'll be back on Wednesday. So I will see you all then. In the meantime, click like, subscribe. I will see you all again. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye-bye.